Hi everyone, welcome to Gaffer and Gear. In today's episode, we're having a look at the DMG Dash, which is a pocket light with a built-in battery. It's built as solid as a rock. It's weather resistant. And on top of that, it has built-in CRMX Lumen radio control. Now, before we get into the review, I would just like to thank Technical Art Solutions for supplying us with today's light. Now, a disclaimer, this light has been given to me to keep, but I'm so impressed, I am gonna buy another three with my own money. All right, so let's get into the positives and we'll talk about what are the two massive positives for me with this unit. Number one, it has CRMX or Lumen Radio Control with RDM. Now, I don't use RDM, but I'm sure that's a big deal for some of you. So what that means is I can operate it over a professional lighting desk or a lighting console, and I don't have to use a phone app. So that, that's a huge plus for me because it integrates in with the rest of my system. The next plus with this, or the next real point of difference between this and other pocket lights, is it's not RGBWW or RGBW. It actually has six emitters. So it has a red, which is a broad spectrum red emitter. It has a lime, a green, a blue, an amber, and a white. So what advantage does that give us? Well, in our CCT mode, the top Kelvin is 10,000 Kelvin. There's no real surprise there. Most RGBWW lights can do that. But because it's got all of those um, additional emitters, namely the phosphor red and the amber, it can go right down into lower Kelvins. So it can go all the way down to 1,700 Kelvin, which um, is way lower than a lot of lights can do. The next advantage is if you're uh, generating colors, the uh, extra emitters allow us to have more vibrant colors um, than you do out of RGB. RGB lights tend to be uh, very vibrant around red, green, and blue, because that's where their emitters are. But uh, with this having additional emitters, particularly the amber and the lime, you get a much more vibrant selection of colors than you do on an RGB unit. Now, of course, it's using all of those color emitters to vector into an accurate white point. So that means if you're a professional lighting technician, this thing is gonna blend in beautifully with your high-end lights. Now, the next thing that is a plus for me, it is dust and weather resistant. So it is water resistant to water hitting it from any direction. The next plus for me is the amount of rigging points. We have a thread on the back, a thread on the bottom, and a thread on the side. Now, they're those type of threads that are made by putting a smaller thread inside a larger thread. So if somebody does strip this, you can get the thread replaced. Now, the back of this isn't magnetized, but it is supplied with a threaded magnet. Now, the next thing I like about this as a plus is it has magnets on the front for the accessories. So you can put a diffuser on very quickly comes with a dome diffuser. You can do combinations. The next plus for me is it comes with a grid that is specifically designed for this unit and actually works when it comes to your lighting control. The next positive is this would have to be the strongest constructed light I've ever reviewed. The bulk of the body is made of some sort of die cast aluminium. The front is absolutely solid. All of the buttons are recessed, so they can't be knocked off. And the dimmer knob is extremely well protected. Now this does come at a cost, that brings us to our first negative. This is heavier than say, an Aperture MC. And the Aperture MCs, being so lightweight, do come in handy. For example, I don't think I'd be able to stick this to the back of a lampshade. However, this is still lightweight enough that you can easily rig it with a decent magnet kit. The next negative for me is as soon as this receives a CRMX signal, it puts you into the CRMX menu and locks you out of the rest of the system. So you can't change anything in your menu system without first turning off your CRMX. As far as negatives go, that's about it. Price point, that was gonna be a negative. But as soon as I got a hold of it and felt the construction, I quickly forgot about the price. All right, let's talk about price and what you get. Now, I can't find any official Australian pricing on this yet, but a single kit, which is this one here, sells for about 400 US dollars. 
and they've got a four kit which has a few other accessories in it and that sells for about 1730 us dollars all right so you get a beautiful constructed bag pretty much every light comes with a bag now you get a usb cable for charging now as far as i can tell um, you can charge the battery and run the light simultaneously uh, except in there's a boost mode where you might need um, a power supply that can supply you with three amps. Okay, you get the light, of course. I've already you know sung the praise of the construction of the light. You get a dome, magnetized dome that clips onto the front. You get a little pouch with your other accessories. So here we've got our grid for controlling our beam angle. We've got a clear uh, filter that goes on the front. So you can use that to mount a gel to the front. So you might have a specific gel color that you can't render using color uh, LED emitters. That can be used to mount that. And you get a flat diffuser. You also get a uh, Ann Rookie style uh, magnet, which is threaded. These are very good magnets. So if you've never used a magnet kit and you buy this, I'm willing to bet that as soon as you have a play with this, you're gonna go out and spend a lot of money on a magnet kit. And it comes with a stand mount as well. All right, so let's quickly go through how to operate the light. To turn the light on, press the power button and hold it down for about three seconds. Okay, so you're up and running. Now, um, the center button here is your menu button, so let's press that down. And that gives you all of the operating modes that you can choose from. So to select your mode, you can scroll with the red button in either direction, or you can press the scroll button here. Okay, so let's select our white mode. Now to select our mode, we press the red button in. Okay, we've got three parameters of adjustment in white mode. We've got intensity, CCT, and plus minus green. Intensity adjusts in 1% increments. Now, if I press the red button in, it'll jump to presets. Now, the next thing across is our CCT. That adjusts in 50 Kelvin increments from 1,700 Kelvin all the way up to 10,000 Kelvin. Now, if I press the button, it'll go through presets. Next is our plus minus green. Again, adjustable in 1% increments, all the way up to 100 plus green, and down to 100 minus green. And if I press the button, it'll scroll through presets again. The next mode of operation is our color mode. Now in our color mode, you can select your intensity, you can select the base CCT at which you desaturate to, then you can select your saturation level and the color hue that you saturate to. Okay, so let's press the button to select. So we've got our intensity, that's pretty straightforward. If I press the selector button, we can go to CCT. So I can dial in any CCT I want. If we press the button again, we can go to saturation. So we can saturate in our color. And with the saturation, if I press the button, we can go to presets. And the last thing I can adjust is our color hue. Now, if I press the button, we can scroll through presets. So the presets are primary and secondary colors. Next thing in the menu is the gels library. So let's select that. Now in the gels library, you can hard switch between 5,600 Kelvin and 3,200 Kelvin. The next thing you can select is the saturation. So you can adjust your saturation by plus 20% or minus 20%. So that's the saturation of the gel that's um, on your base CCT color. And then you can also adjust the hue angle of the gel slightly by plus or minus 10 degrees. Last thing we can select, of course, is the gel. Now there's only about 100 gels in the gels library, but these gels are Roscoe verified. So what I mean by that is if you get a tungsten light, an actual tungsten filament light, put a gel on it, and you find that gel in this menu on the light, the two will match. Okay, let's go back to the menu system. Next thing on the menu is effects. So it's got your cop cars, things like that. 
Now it doesn't have a huge amount of effects. Let's just scroll through to the effect selector. It doesn't have a huge amount of effects, but it's not wasting your time with effects that are crap either. So, you know, the effects that are on here are effects that you're probably likely to use. All right, let's uh, get back into the menu system. We've got the next thing down is source matching. So source matching is um, sort of real world lights. So mercury vapors, sodium vapors, things like that. Street lights you might come across. There's also green screen and blue screen selection in here. So we'll just have a quick look through. So what's sodium vapor, mercury vapor, tungsten, tungsten domestic. Uh, what's low pressure sodium, high pressure sodium, frosty moonlight, candle flame, blue screen, and a green screen preset. Okay, let's go back to our menu. The last thing on the menu is our settings. So let's select that. So you can turn Bluetooth on and off. Now, the Bluetooth is for the phone app. I would suggest that if you buy these lights, you definitely need to use the phone app because uh, using the phone app, you can update the firmware in the lights without having to connect to a PC. And you can um, update the firmware on four lights simultaneously. So definitely want the, um, the app for if nothing more than to upload the um, firmware updates. The next thing in the menu is the CRMX, which is your Lumen Radio. So you can select on off. Um, you can link, uh, select your, whether you link or unlink. You can turn your RDM on and off. You can select your address and you can select your profile mode. So there's how many profiles? Not a huge amount, but they're all workable. Okay, so let's turn our CRMX on. And you can see it is linked. Now I can go across to here and press the button and unlink it to my transmitter. So it's ready to be linked into someone else's transmitter. Now we'll just go back into the menu and the last thing to select is factory reset. Also on this page up the top is the serial number of the device plus your firmware version. Now the last thing to note is the light does have a boost mode. So to get into boost mode, hold the button down for three seconds and it will display your parameters. So the maximum operating temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. This boost mode gives you an extra 25% power. All right, so let's have a look at how this thing responds to Lumen Radio or CRMX. All right, now the first thing I want to point out is if you're using one of these over CRMX and its commands are very slow and very steppy, what you need to do is go into the menu system and turn off the Bluetooth, okay? Because the Bluetooth receiver transmitter interferes with the CRMX receiver, okay? So turn off the Bluetooth and you'll have a much smoother ride, okay? So uh, let's pop across now to the light and have a look. Now I'm running an eight bit profile here. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is see how it goes with an on off command. Okay, so there's no stepping here at all. That's beautiful. Okay, now let's do a five second fade up. And a five second fade down. Now let's change that to two and a half seconds. Let's do a fade up and a fade down. Now I don't think you'll be able to see it on my camera here, but there is a little bit of, of, of shimmering on the fade downs. Very subtle bit of shimmering. I don't think it's gonna show up on most cameras though. But it's only on the fade downs. Okay, let's have a look at a one second fade down now. See how that goes. fade up and again there's a slight bit of shimmering only on the fade down the fade up's beautiful I don't think we're going to see it on, on a camera okay let's go down to half a second now programming in half a second fade and let's go okay now let's chuck this thing over to 3200 Kelvin and see how it goes switching between 3200 and 5600 so it's doing an instant step across command and that's uh, that's very smooth. All right, let's do five seconds. Let's go back the other way. So what I'm checking for is if I can use this thing for in-shot uh, color transitions. So as the camera's running. All right, let's go um, half a second now. Again, that's very smooth. 
Let's go to one second now. A lot of cameras get very violent at it. Sorry, a lot of lights get very violent at one second. This one's quite smooth. That's very smooth. Even, even to my eye, that is incredibly smooth. Let's go down to half a second now. Okay, now let's go to a color hue. So I'm going instantly between white and color hue. No problems there, no stepping in the engine. Let's do a five second transition. It's a little bit steppy, but I don't think a camera is going to see it. Okay, let's go two and a half seconds now. So the reason I test at different speeds, uh, a lot of lights react differently at different speeds. No problems there. Let's go to one second. Let's push our luck and go to half a second. Most lights are really violent at half a second. Let's have a look. I don't know if that's gonna show up in camera, but it's very sort of jittery. So it, it sort of jitters a lot between the, the transitions at half a second, as most lights do. All right, so that's the CRMX. So once again, if you start, if you get some really um, noticeable stepping, in the in the CRMX, you have to turn off the Bluetooth receiver. Okay, let's start going through all the data I've collected. And just to add a bit of excitement to this segment, I've decided to leave the light in disco mode. All right, let's start off with battery run times. Now, my battery run times are very different to some other reviewers. So I just want to explain how I got these run times. So I had the light set to 5,600 Kelvin, running at 100% brightness, with its Bluetooth and Lumen radio receivers turned on, and I get a constant two hours and 38 minutes of runtime. Now let's have a look at our brightness, and these readings were taken at a distance of one meter with no modifier and with the dome connected. Now let's take a look at the average CCT accuracies, and I've taken my measurements at 100 Kelvin increments with the dome attached. Between 1,700 Kelvin to 3,000 Kelvin, the light was accurate to plus or minus 53 Kelvin. Between 3 to 4,000 Kelvin, the average accuracy was minus 56 Kelvin. Between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin, the average accuracy was minus 99 Kelvin. Between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin, the average accuracy was minus 198 Kelvin. And between 6,000 and 7,000 Kelvin, the average accuracy was minus 275 Kelvin. Now with your CCTs, they are slightly more accurate if you don't have the dome on, but I figure if you're doing any color critical work, you're probably gonna have the dome on anyway. All right, let's take a look at our color render scores. Between 1,700 Kelvin and 2,050 Kelvin, the higher the Kelvin, the more accurate the TN30 color vector score. At 1,700 Kelvin, it came in at 82, and by the time it gets to 2,050 Kelvin, it's at 90. Between 2,100 Kelvin and 3,000 Kelvin, it averages 93.1. Between 3,000 and 4,000 Kelvin, it averages 94.7. Between 4,000 to 5,000 Kelvin, it scores 94. Between 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin, it scores 92.8. Between 6,000 to 7,000 Kelvin, it comes in at 91.6. Now let's have a look at the white point measured in Delta UV. And like all of my results, my data was collected at 100 Kelvin increments with the dome attached. Between 1,700 Kelvin and 2,800 Kelvin, the higher the Kelvin, the more accurate the white point. At 1,700 Kelvin, it comes in with a delta UV of minus 0 0.0040. By the time it gets to 2,800 Kelvin, it's got a super accurate delta UV of plus 0 0.0003. Between 2,800 Kelvin and 4,000 Kelvin, the average is plus 0 0.0003. Between 4,000 Kelvin and 5,000 Kelvin, the average is plus 0 0.0008. 
between 5000 Kelvin and 6000 Kelvin, the average is plus 0.0013. Between 6000 Kelvin and 7000 Kelvin, the average is plus 0.0017. And all the way up at 10,000 Kelvin, the delta UV is plus 0.0005. Let's have a closer look at some of the Kelvins now, starting with the lowest Kelvin that we can dial in. When I dialed in 1,700 Kelvin, I got 1,645. The TN30 color vector scores were an average 82% color accuracy with an average 105% saturation. Here are the CRI numbers, and as I would expect at such a low Kelvin, a lot of the numbers are below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution, and the delta UV came in at minus 0.0040. When I dialed in 3200 Kelvin, I got 3166 with an SSI score of 84. Color vector testing came in with a 95% color accuracy with an average 100% saturation. Here are the CRI scores. Only R9 and R12 are below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the white point is very accurate at plus 0.0003 delta UV. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,308. The TM30 color vector scores were 94% average color accuracy with an average 101% saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the delta UV comes in at plus 0.0006. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,412 with an SSI score of 71. The TN30 color vector testing reveals a score of 93% color accuracy with an average 102% saturation. Here are the CRI scores and only R12 is below 90. This is the spectrum distribution and the delta UV comes in at plus 0.0011, which places it above the Planckian curve but below the daylight curve. When I dialed in 10,000 Kelvin, I got 9,314. TN30 color vector testing came in with an 88% average color accuracy with an average 100% color saturation. Here are the CRI scores, R3, R6, R10, and R12 are below 90. Here is the spectrum distribution, and the delta UV came in at plus 0.0005. Now again, all of those results were taken with the dome on. Now let's have a look at how accurately the light dials in a color vector. Again, with the dome attached. Red, which should be zero degrees, came in at two degrees. Green, which should be 120 degrees, came in at 120. Blue, which should be 240 degrees, came in at 240. Yellow, which should be 60, came in at 43 degrees. Cyan, which should be 180, came in at 174. And magenta, which should be 300, came in at 294. Now let's have a look at how accurately this light can desaturate its colors. So I'm desaturating to 50%. I've got the light set to a white point of 5,500 Kelvin, so I can do my testing to the D55 standard. Red came in at four degrees with 29% saturation. Green came in at 118 degrees with 47% saturation. Blue came in at 245 degrees with 88% saturation. Yellow came in at 44 degrees with 70% saturation. Cyan came in at 174 degrees with 54% saturation. And magenta came in at 296 degrees with 45% saturation. Well, that's another episode of Gaffer and Gear, and I can't emphasize enough how happy I am to, to finally have a small accent light like this that I can have on set and I can run off Lumen Radio. I don't need to have a mobile phone app running. So that is um, a huge plus for me. I'm really excited by that. All right, see you on the next episode of Gaffer and Gear. Take care of each other on set.